Bonsoir, good evening. So welcome. Um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, tonight to you um, Jan Chadikov, uh, who will uh, be speaking uh, uh, this evening about Toronto. Very near situation, but a very interesting one for us. This is a part of the series Learning From. Uh, is a series that we regularly do on uh, the cities, if we can still use this word. Um, I am Mirko Zardini, I am uh, the director of the Canadian Centre. And um, this uh, series, Learning Forum, of course, is uh, coming from the title Learning from Las Vegas of Venturi, who has been so, and uh, Denise Scott Brown, who has been so important as a vastly influential publication. The series this year will focus uh, on uh, very different situations. We start uh, Toronto, and I think that you have the opportunity to have a very interesting view of Toronto tonight, thanks to Jan. There will be Beirut, Burkina Faso, and Sao Paulo. Um, Toronto is interesting for us, and Jan is very interesting for us because he did an incredible work. He did a, a, a real uh, um, effort to understand, present, uh, and shape the understanding of Toronto as uh, around the idea of uh, migration of cultures, uh, hybrid situation, and uh, this kind of uh, interesting sit new condition that uh, this uh, uh, migration this uh, presence of such a multicultural society uh, has created. Generally, this kind of thing has been uh, uh, recognized by political studies, social studies. I think it's very interesting to look at that from an urban and architectural point of view. Jan, uh, Jan Chorikov is an architect, is an urban designer, and he, he has a very influential role in Canada. He is the editor of uh, Canadian Architect magazine. And more and more, this magazine is becoming influential not only in Canada, but also abroad, because uh, there is a general interest, at least uh, more than in the past, uh, on what is going on in Canada. Um, he has uh, developed a lot of researches, focusing uh, on um, the idea of social change at the urban scale, he has a worked and considered many cities, very specific. Uh, he has also developed a specific interest for Africa and Italy, uh, which will be something that we will come back in the future. Um, over the past two years, uh, he has um, worked uh, around the city, in the city of Toronto, and uh, uh, he has uh, also produced, as part of this research, a very interesting exhibition in the past in Toronto. Fringe benefits, cosmopolitan dynamics and of a multicultural city. That is uh, the, the perspective uh, of Jan tonight. There will be a question at the end, and I would like to remind you that uh, um, this event and uh, the question period will be uh, recorded and some of these uh, recordings will be used, uh, the excerpt of these uh, may be used for educational or for promotional purposes on the web. So you are online, most probably. And for sure, you are going to be online. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here. I'm sure it will be very, very interesting. So please join me in uh, welcoming Jan tonight here at CCA. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mirko, and thank you uh, for the CCA for having me come uh, to present uh, this evening. Um, now, what I intend to do is hopefully uh, alter your um, preconce preconceived notions about what Toronto is, also to try and understand a new methodological lens to not only look at a city like Toronto, but to look at cities around the world. Uh, I think it's important for um, 
well, maybe we'll, we'll just sort of discuss as we go along, but it's important for us to understand as architects, as urban designers, landscape architects, how do we affect change in the city? How do we leverage uh, the added dimension of multiculturalism, of, of global social capital, the flat earth that, we, that uh, Thomas Friedman talks about? How do we leverage that as designers and facilitate that for um, a very new and contemporary 21st century city? The slide that you see here on, on, the, on the screen was um, by, uh, taken by a, a, a colleague of mine, Narendra Pakshedi, and it's, um, it's in Toronto. Well, it's actually, sorry, not in Toronto. It's in the city of Mississauga, which is adjacent to Toronto, a suburb of 800,000 people, by the way, sixth largest municipality in the country, and is sort of under the radar of, of, of people that are not from the city. Um, and we see uh, this gentleman who's set, sitting here in front of his shop on a, on an, in an area of, of Mississauga, and it could be anywhere in the world. The point is, is that it, in effect, is everywhere in the world because this man has connections to Karachi, to Lahore, to uh, Islamabad, to anywhere, to New York, Los Angeles, and Mississauga. But to kind of take us out for a second, and that's, I know Mirko mentioned my work in, in uh, the transnational migration between uh, Senegal and Italy. I just want to take us out just to kind of break down our preconceived notions about what a city is, how we see a city around us. And this photograph here is in Geneva, and it's of a murid uh, from West Africa, an Islamic murid wearing a boo-boo, traveling through the streets of Geneva, and a young generation, uh, a young African is on a cell phone in the left-hand image. And just to sh uh, indicative of the fact that global capital doesn't just carry, doesn't just wear a suit and a fancy attache case with a Swiss bank account inside, um, it really uh, relates to a whole gamut of individuals that work uh, around the world. So, and, and there's a method of, of looking at the city, almost uh, understanding the simultaneity. In this photograph in Chinatown Canal Street in New York, you see this clueless man in an L.L. Bean's uh, vest on the lower side of the image, just got out of the taxi cab, he's from Wichita or somewhere, maybe from Montreal, and he's looking around for a cheap handbag in New York, but he's sort of clueless and oblivious to the world that happens about 10 feet above his head with the various businesses, the various uh, uh, other elements that happen in the city around him that he cannot see. And similarly, when we look on Canal Street in New York and we see how people appropriate or merchants appropriate public space, uh, they, they transgress the realm from private into public to uh, redefine or renegotiate a new method of commercial space, um, it's sort of, you know, Arcus speak for saying that these guys who are selling cheap hats are rethinking the way we understand our city. And it's that methodology that I think we can at least look at and try and just take note and document because just as they uh, move their, their, their stores out onto the sidewalk, there's also methods of moving into abandoned parking lots and occupying them for a vital marketplace that could happen within the city. And it's these methods that we should acknowledge because they are ways of, imp uh, they're sort of toeholds or ways of threading the needle to improve our city and make it a richer place. We always think that people are saying, oh, how multicultural Toronto is, how multicultural Montreal is, but every city in the world is multicultural. So the question now is, what are we going to do about it? You go to Florence and you see, you know, Ponte Vecchio and how beautiful and global it is as a tourist destination. We see people on the street selling, um, looking all theatrical and getting, trying to stand like a statue so we can give them a few uh, euro. But when we also see a man f from uh, West Africa selling handbags, we, we should also realize that that individual is part of a greater network, a greater network that uses cities, the contemporary city, any contemporary city, and any city probably is contemporary for that matter, as a way to establish networks, to develop networks. And our questions is, a question might be, how does that take root or affect change in our city? And again, it's issues of simultaneity, because the global capital doesn't just move from within the Chinese community, within the Lebanese community, within a French-speaking or English-speaking community, but they crisscross as another network. So when you see Chinese merchants selling handbags to that same African on commission, 
and he goes out into the city and re gets that m and take collects that money, and um, uh, or operates out of uh, African specifically African markets, which you see on the lower image, which is in some ways from a distance replicates a traditional uh, um, city market, and you take and you occupy those spaces and you start in, in adding uh, entrenching those those the social capital into an, a physical environment, even if it's a temporary physical environment, as is that market on the left or selling things on the street, you take it and it transfers back into another world that's connected to Geneva, to Pescara, to Montreal or Toronto via Western Union or bank transfers or any kind of money transfers via cheap telecommunications, microwave towers, the sky and, and outside of, of Dakar can be in touch with anyone in the world and you have development, urban development big time either funded through just remittances or funded through religious means. So when you come to a city like Toronto, you understand, well, wait a second, is Toronto that much different than any other city? Yes and no. Yes, meaning yeah, there, are, uh, there are intellectual um, network, social capital networks, there's financial networks that transfer from within um, different ethnic groups not, and that might be formally recognized, that might be formally recognized or understood by the wider population or might be distinct and germane to specific populations, Sri Lankans and Chinese or uh, the Ghanaians that live in Toronto. And this image is interesting to me because it is taken near a community called Thorncliffe Park. Thorncliffe Park is uh, a home to about 38,000 individuals. We'll see the images in a few moments. But uh, when this bridge was constructed in the 1960s, it's sort of ironic that there was no Muslim population in the vicinity. And in 2010, it's the highest percentage of Muslim Canadians in, in a highest neighborhood of, of, highest percentage of Muslim Canadians anywhere in the country. And it's interesting that the bridge takes up a sort of a, based on an Islamic pattern on the, embedded in the, in the concrete um, guardrails. And so it shows in the foreground there's a cultural, cultural signifier or something about a neighborhood that's maybe specific or maybe unusual or different. And way in the distance you have the downtown core of Toronto. Be and it's important because to someone from Thorncliffe Park, as the same as someone from the first slide that we saw, a, a Pakistani merchant in Mississauga, the CN Tower, uh, Toronto Dominion Centre, you know, IM Pays, Commerce Court, all these buildings or, or any of the College Street, Queen Streets and the funky neighborhoods of Toronto are meaningless. Meaningless to these communities that could spend half a, you know, can spend a significant component of their day and a significant component of their daily wage just even to take the bus and get downtown. Toronto is a community where a lot of the youth don't even know, in some areas of the city, don't even realize this, that Toronto is on a lake because the relevancy to where they live is not the relevancy to where, to, uh, is not as relevant to the, maybe the way my cohort might uh, envision the city of Toronto. And there's a gap, and that's why it's interesting you see this great landscape as an intermediary between the downtown core and where we stand. So the idea of fringe benefits, um, which was uh, the, the name coming from what are the benefits or what are the changes that are happening on the fringes of the city? can be thought of in a way as a genealogical uh, uh, um, chart where our great grandfathers might have arrived in Kensington Market in downtown Toronto uh, and in our, our, our fathers lived somewhere on Bathurst Street and we might live in Thornhill, in Richmond Hill or in other words the fringes or the suburbs of the city. And the same goes for our Chinese neighbours, the same goes for Italian neighbours, the same goes for a lot of ethnic groups in the city. And so the map that you see in front of you, if, it, if you're trying to understand why, I, don't under, I kind of know what Toronto looks like, but this doesn't look like Toronto, only because it's the map of Toronto that we normally look at, flipped 180 degrees. So the downtown waterfront, all the precious real estate is in the very top corner in the middle. And all the other municipalities that border Toronto, Ajax, Pickering, Markham, et cetera, et cetera, are shown with the municipal boundaries in place. The light gray that you see is 
act areas of active immigration over the past 10 years in the greater Toronto area. And so as you see, the downtown core is, very, is a dark gray because there's, people don't come to Kensington Market and move their way out to the suburbs anymore. They fly directly from, if they're going to take the plane from Hyderabad, they'll, they'll land in, in Toronto and they'll go to their friends or they'll go to their, 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 the networks that they know best out in Markham or Brampton or Mississauga. The, the circles that you see are associated with just a sample of ethnic groups that, we, that I looked at from uh, the census tract from the, the latest one in 2006 to see where population centers are. And kind of to try and approximate it, it's not a, uh, this one, it's not a precise map, but it starts to show uh, a network. So when you see um, the Chinese community is in, the, is in the blue. So Chinatown that you uh, all, that we all, well, I think this is a phenomenon across all North American cities, that the traditional Chinatown that we see today in our city centers are statistically and relatively speaking relics. They're almost, you know, I mean, they, they still attract a fair number of Chinese within that, within that district of the downtown core, like on Spadina in to downtown Toronto. But the bulk of the Chinese population in Toronto happens northern Toronto, like, in other words, just that bar across in Scarborough, or in Markham. And the same goes for the South Asian. And then if you also notice the Italian uh, sector as well, the small dot at the very top is College Street, otherwise known as Little Italy. But where the real and the big and the significant Italian community exists is in Vaughan. So the map is really an important uh, document in the sense that it shows how we, we need to kind of shift our, our understanding of the dynamics of the city to, to realize where, where real growth occurs and where real opportunities exist. So, as I said, old patterns of migration. Here, you know, the Hamish bagel shop and the kosher grocer and the, and the religious, you know, Jewish kid getting home for Friday night dinner on his bicycle. It looks like he's even on a cell phone. I don't know if that's allowed. Uh, cars are definitely not. But um, it, it's, a, it's a type of activity that you would see um, on the middle of the map here, um, that green line of, the Jewish, of, of where the Jewish centrality is uh, in Toronto. Um, along the Bathurst Street corridor. So this is Bathurst Street, um, and you know it's all, it's starting. It's um, it's a 1950s form of, of urbanism, and it's and it's um, I wouldn't say it's it's decaying, but it's static, but it's almost like a throughput. But now when you see the same corridor across the street, as you also notice, they're nested within um, these areas are Filipino groceries, wire transfers, the same type of activity that you would see with a, a West African population in Geneva, you would see with a Filipino community in Toronto. So two Filipino nannies or Filipino um, caregivers walking up Bathurst Street. Next, there's a kosher butcher in the background, and two doors down is a, is a, a large Filipino grocery and, and wire and money transfer center. Um, again, if you move up that traditional path of migration to, the, to Thornhill, where you start to see um, not only is it become less urban and less unified, but, um, but it also becomes more intense about a uh, percentage of the Jewish population in Toronto that lives within this particular community versus um, ones that are more urban, traditionally urban, naming, you know, Orm and Nahum Way, et cetera. And you start seeing other signs of simultaneity, nannies and caregivers located in kind of derelict, um, well, not cared for urban areas. So this is part of the ugly side of the dynamics that we're seeing that shift out of the city. But now you have to understand where can the positive aspects be and where, how can we leverage, again, our awareness and our skills as designers to really make uh, a city like Toronto or any cosmopolitan city truly globally competitive. So the Fringe Benefits Exhibition, we looked at kind of three, three areas that kind of typify the type of, of, of urbanism that you might find. And the A is the inner suburbs. Those are the 19, you know, beginning from the 1950s onwards. And you might find uh, high-rise towers. You might find traditional kind of 50s strip malls um, still connected within the Toronto Parks and Ravine um, system. And in B, you have along uh, sort of an outer, outer fringe um, development 
1970s onwards tends to be more of the of, uh, subdivisions, more uh, alienated types of strip mall centers. And then out in, in section C is uh, the Brampton and Mississauga, which we can look at in a few minutes. But the inner suburbs, as you know, Toronto uh, was at one time very progressive about thinking about high density, mixed income, dynamic suburban areas that were not uh, necessarily uh, Forgotten, not necessarily, un definitely not unplanned, and definitely not uncared for. This is the the Roehampton uh, development out uh, near uh, in East York. When you see uh, these kinds of inner suburban developments, they were uh, rather idyllic. Uh, uh, another generation from kind of the the, in the downtown uh, um, public housing that you might see in Lawrence Heights or Regent Park but uh, you would see something a little bit more um, uh, imbalanced. But of course, all the photos have little blonde boys um, playing, or blonde girls playing, and it's very homogeneous in its ethnic and, and uh, cultural makeup. So that's the image that you see on the left, but the image today is a different type of scenario. You have different types of families living in different social needs, and we have to kind of learn to readdress those conditions. So these inner suburbs, over time, has often kind of become this uh, type of environment. This is not the cover that you would see at the City of Toronto was to produce how diverse and multicultural are we. We, as the City of Toronto, uh, prefer to have garbage strewn across our you know, bus shelters, uh, underserving a lot of uh, new, new Canadian families who are, are living in, in suburban contexts with food islands and, um, and inadequate transit. Again, you turn around, this is not the, the CIBC ad, again, for the Multicultural Canada of 2010. Um, and it's something that we need to address because these people all uh, have educations, they all have aspirations, they all have families, they have um, friends and networks, and they have skills, and um, we should be a little bit more uh, proactive about understanding what their needs are to maybe bring jobs closer to where they live as well as understanding how they live so that they can um, enhance and maintain their respective networks and be even and be more um, ennobled and empowered in their communities. So again, how do we reinforce our new way of seeing in the city? And this was an, a, an interesting photograph. Again, part of the lessons I'm throwing at you again is the aspects of simultaneity. And these were photographs taken by uh, Cécile Martin, who I don't know who's in the audience tonight or not, but uh, she is from Montreal, and she took these photographs uh, in Mississauga, sort of using a camera and sort of overlaying with her uh, uh, panorama style the types of things that you might see. And, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint them out precisely, but if you look carefully, like the second photograph from the top, you see there's a UPS store, and it's a shadow of someone who can rip off a little tab to say, you know, cheap taxes or I'll do some, do your, do uh, your altering your clothes or I'll clean your house or people waiting for the bus, people looking for a Dollarama shops, people going to a dentist, people going to an accountant that uh, speaks Hindi and um, uh, you have to appreciate the fact that in the city if you look around even standing on one spot and you focus on various elements you see aspects of simultaneity that's very rich, very rich and it starts to redefine the way we see the world. The same way that if, if the, the Filipino nanny and the, and the Jewish kid might shop and go to the same mall, but at different times of the day, and they're completely oblivious to each other. You know, Booby's getting bagels at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the Filipino nanny singing karaoke at 10 o'clock at night, all within the same geographic locale. So that simultaneity is important. Issues of traditional public parks, a very popular park in Toronto and Sunnybrook Park, it also happens to be... Uh, Yes, a lot of um, people might go play ultimate frisbee and all that softball after work, but there's also huge competitions between Tamil and Sri Lankan and all kinds of uh, aspects of the, of the Toronto South Asian community playing cricket after work as well. So these derelict landscapes that we see are often hiding in behind some very rich territories. In this case, we have um, Thorncliffe Park, which I mentioned earlier, is situated on the left in those towers. This is the very popular Don Valley Parkway um, Expressway, 
but in between is a huge area of parkland or in the summers you can go and you'll see barbecues you'll see people gathering uh, for uh, picnics uh, hundreds of people at a time family picnics even wedding parties that you might see in there and it's uh, important to recognize that what you see from a bird's eye view and you see the BMWs whisking downtown uh, on the Don Valley Parkway if you get out of the car and you walk into Thorncliffe Park or other areas adjacent to these large landscapes and you start to see how people really begin to use them and very actively so. So, uh, and you start to see the, the demographic makeup found, found within these communities. So it's those multiple layers of simultaneity I was talking about. So if you're looking for um, a sari or, an, or you're looking for a Hindu astrologer, you'll find it. Of course, if you're looking for a Tim Hortons and a double-double coffee, you'll also see that as well. But if you're looking for one, you may not see the other. And it's that aspect that we have to understand in Toronto uh, or any other city that's very important. Because those parks that we um, learn to appreciate or ignore, as you see here, turn over and become very um, active places for different ethnicities to gather in the city. Um, community gardens, it's the same thing. Community gardens is a very important tool in urban planning to bring out, to, to make uh, a very um, uh, intense um, social uh, mixer for, for aspects of the community. In Malvern, which is near, um, not in this photograph, but in Malvern, there is a Tamil, a woman's Tamil gardening community. And they gather around community gardens, and after several years now, they come and start speaking up for issues of domestic abuse, for single parenthood, for children who are not attending school, and it's kind of a, it's a tool that they've sort of developed that social cohesion around the community garden. So here we see these community gardens and the base of these big towers, and we see aspects of religion and suburb, and we see that there are elements here that are very rich. You know, if you were to kind of really abstract this, maybe you might think this could be a very uh, active small town in Canada or Europe or el elsewhere, i.e. density, people that live close to each other, places to pray, places to shop. But when you start t zooming out and actually reassembling it, you have a big, vast parking lot separating people from uh, community spaces, and you have um, unwieldy, often unwieldy residential towers that prevent people from, ad hoc, from impromptu social gatherings. Thorncliffe Park that I mentioned is um, a very, this is a, a, the school that's a photograph of the school in Thorncliffe Park. There's about 45 different ethnicities that attend the school. There's over 2,000 students. The school was recently renovated by uh, an architect by the name of Stephen Teeple, and it already needs another renovation. Um, simply because it's just overcrowded. But it's an interesting example of how um, contemporary architecture in a small, in a capital A architectural sense, can tr attempt to develop um, opportunities for these kids to learn about each other, to mix, to have uh, play, lots of areas of play, both on an intimate scale and a large scale, to prevent bullying and other things, um, but in a way that, that, that's a very empowering and uplifting environment in an educational way. So it's something, one, one tool to draw out of, of, of the, that scenario. Another one is kind of rethinking our um, value of what a, uh, our global culture, how global culture mixes in with suburbia in, in, our, in the contemporary city. And I show this slide, because this is the Aga Khan Development Network's um, uh, site planning for um, and Don Mills. It was a former Bata building. I don't know if many of you know it. It was a, a kind of a mediocre parkin uh, internationalist building built in 73 that was taken down a couple of years ago to great, um, the architects were all up in arms, complaining we're losing, in brackets, a mediocre modernist building. What are we going to do, right? And not that I, I you know, I, I, some of my favorite buildings are modernist buildings, but the thing is, is that what you, you can't sort of say that we are still a 1950s modernist sub suburb and not um, take the opportunity to grow and really become a 21st century global city. And this is an opportunity and it's just about ready to begin construction and it's a very interesting project because it has um, uh, the Aga Khan Museum by Fumihiko Maki, it has a, a, a Smiley a cultural center by Charles Correa, 
from, from who lives in, in Mumbai, and it has um, a, a marvelous um, landscape um, a component with, uh, on the site. This is kind of an early rendering of, of Fumihiko Maki's massing. It's not very impressive, but the thing is, is that it, you're bringing in um, a, a sense of place and an investiture in a sense of place that's both global in its implications, very local in its application because it, it, it's specifically geared for not just the Ismaili community in Toronto, which number around 70,000, but uh, a lot of the Muslim Canadians that live within the region. And to bring this kind of architecture rather than another strip mall that, that, that serves up ethnic groceries is, not, is, a, is a step in a direction that's very progressive and something that should be encouraged. Um, so evolving and our identity. This is, this is kind of a, a, an unusual and interesting situation that you see all over Toronto and elsewhere. You know, former Marx Work Warehouse becomes a Sikh uh, spiritual center. But what starts to be interesting, the cue, clues, cues are very small and it's almost like, Ian, you have to be kind of a nut to kind of go out and say things. But when you go to India and you see people, they paint trees or they change the landscape, they do minor cues and you start seeing that happening here in the parking lot where people are actually applying, um, adopting kind of a sense of promenade through this very banal parking lot to the spiritual center. And you go, well, that's not architecture. And yes, it's not architecture the way we as architects um, celebrate architecture. But it is a direction or a clue, an indication of how community is trying to make something out of nothing. Um, similarly, you see in strip malls various um, religious centers occurring. Next to grocery stores, you have a, a, good, a gudwara, a Sikh, a, a holy uh, temple. You have um, the religious icons or religious elements, uh, the, the, or the wrapped pole in the middle of a parking lot, but it's in the middle of a parking lot at the end of a strip mall. You have a masjid. Um, I want to take a photo of to go back and get, but every time I go, I kind of feel a bit shy about it. But at certain times of day, there are 250 cabs parked on that lot to go into this masjid. It's the end of an industrial street on the side of an industrial street near a suburban thoroughfare. Here's another one, and it's interesting because it's place of praise. It's sort of ironic, and it's place of praise that's in a, at the end of a city in a, in a suburban uh, warehouse distribution center. So how do you take those spaces and ennoble them? And again, you know, not that a second time mentioned is one architect, Stephen Teeple, but he's an architect who somehow is able to understand this intrinsically, even if he doesn't make a big stink about it. He's able to take, um, this, is a, a really, this is a church for uh, Chinese Baptists in uh, Scarborough. It's not the most uh, ennobled or, or, or romantic place in the city, but it's a place, but through a very modest budget and, mo and uh, a couple of very interesting forms, he's able to take the idea of a simple community church and make something exciting out of it. I'm not saying he gets the steel siding from, you know, this is his architectural precedent. Hardly uh, something to be, you know, worthy of a cover of any magazine, but it is um, worthy of, of a methodology that understands the kind of the, the very, um, very community-based and very modest understand, belief in developing a sense of religious identity around a community center in a suburban environment. And here you have the result. On a more uh, um, very ostentatious in a way or overt approach is you have um, the, the Baps uh, Munder. It's a, a, a sect of um, Hinduism that, that some people feel is a little, uh, I won't get in, into sort of the politics of it, but let's say it's a sect, um, a Hindu um, uh, uh, Muslim sect that is um, building these, these munders around the world based out of these hand-carved elements of marble that are created, numbered, created, shipped, and reassembled, in this case, um, in, Missis in the city of Toronto, just on the, on the nexus between Toronto and, and Mississauga. And this is kind of a very interesting drawing. I like it because you, it's rare that you see such a, 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 it looks like something by Titian or something, but it, where you see the, the project uh, manager, site engineer, and geotechnical specialist, and of course the client, all gathering to do some inspections on the site. 
Um, it's not the usual kind of photo you, you'd see, but it's, uh, it, it, it's indicative of the, the understanding how the architecture, which this is the building here, it's a $40 million temple that is, gets basically carved in India, transplanted to Toronto, becomes an instant sort of icon. Of course, the, the criticism of it is that a near uh, replica or the, almost the identical plan to, this, to the same temple has been built in London and in Melbourne. And so one starts to kind of question, is this uh, a, a very high form of franchise religiosity that's, pre that's presented in a very overt icon globally? Or is this, this really an honest way to, to bring out um, the sense of community and identity and pride in a, in a community in, Tor in the Toronto area? And then that's the, it's the question mark, but it shows the extreme between the example of, of this mandir and the Chinese Baptist Church as both elements of religious, um, elements that create religious, um, through religious identity, create community. Another things that are sort of fascinating to me are these distribution areas around the city of Toronto and the region. In this case, it's just in Brampton off of Airport Road where you have these, these uh, buildings that are essentially uh, places to get wholesale goods, wholesale saris, unlock cell phones, you know, uh, tax services, book distribution centers, very odd um, places, uh, massage parlors and things like that. And you have um, a, a recombinant form of community, a an, an highfalutin term, recombinant form of community, which basically means in this photograph, you start to see um, various businesses you see uh, not just businesses, but you see community newspapers being offered up. You see a new form of public life. It's a new kind of a promenade in where you see the mother and, his, and her, her son walking down the sidewalk that's effectively um, the only sort of urbanistic move of that sidewalk is to prevent the car from smashing into the Punjabi uh, sports shop. But it creates a new sense of place. And it kind of goes in your head and you go, well, wait a second, maybe maybe there's an opportunity to, to create a centrality of community within, um, you know, emerging from uh, the dead mall or the underserved mall or the warehouse distribution center. It's ambitious, I know, but there, but there is a, the, the, the strength of community and, and desire and the hunger is there, so much so that we can't sort of ignore that potential. Here's something that's another thing that was interesting, and I should the, start with the drawing. The drawing in itself should tell you that it, it has a, another kind of a global aesthetic. We all know the Ram Kulhas aesthetic or the Sana aesthetic. We study this in architecture, we understand these. We know the modernist aesthetic, but we also um, should be familiar, and some of us are more familiar with that than others, the, the sort of gouache aesthetic of the rendering that you might see presented in Hyderabad, Lahore, or Singapore. And this is a mall that was presented and uh, a rendering for a mall that was developed in Airport Road in Mississauga. You see a Gudwara in the distance and in the front you have a Mughal inspired um, shopping mall made of marble panels but really marble chips impregnated into precast concrete elements uh, assembled um, for a variety of shops and services um, um, travel agents, um, financial um, uh, mortgage brokers, accountants, etc. And you have it reassembled and it's kind of a, there is something poetic, this was a photograph taken by Peter McCallum, and there's something poetic about this because it almost touches down, it's sort of cosmopolitan in its, in its nature in the sense of um, it's multicultural, but it doesn't have to be in Mississauga, it can be anywhere. It's a Mississauga out of, out of convenience because there's enough of a community to support this kind of business. There's enough community uh, that needs to um, assemble in this kind of uh, quasi-public uh, space. And it, it uh, also is a portal into the realities of a lot of, of the rapid growth in some of these communities in the greater Toronto area. That Gudwara um, has about eight classroom portables out back. So there's enough people that want to send their kids to school, there's enough interest, there's enough of socioeconomic desire to maintain um, a confidence in your own identity while giving your children um, a certain type of education, and there's a need. And so it's, is it a 
path to the future. I don't know if I really want to say it's a path to the future, but it's an indicative of a groundswell of, of, um, of um, energy and, and necessity to improve the urban environment. This is um, called the Pacific Mall. And it's, um, it was built in Markham. Markham, by the way, which is uh, about 65% visible minority. A lot of, mostly Chinese, but there's a lot of Iranians that live in, in Markham as well. But in 1994, around the time that this mall was built, there were 27,000 people living in the town of Markham. Today, there are 275,000 people that live in this community. And when this mall was built, it was, um, the councillors, it was much more homogeneous, and the city council was very much a white community. And so they were feeling a bit threatened by having this large-scale Chinese mall come to Markham. And so the developers, who are actually instantly uh, not Chinese developers, but Jewish developers, this is another reason it goes to show the crisscross between communities in, in, in our planet Earth, is uh, to try and have a little bit more of a, uh, as you see, the traditional, the gabled roofs, and have a, a form that was more, that was not Asian-specific. And so you start to see these are subsequent developments that went up around the, the, the mall. And then, of course, you have the, the faux new urbanist uh, element of, of a shopping experience, which inside there's one long interior court corridor where you can get all kinds of, of, of fantastic Chinese food and groceries. And there it is up close. And you, you start to look at the, 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 the elements of this traditionalist building start to break down and function very differently, like almost like a machine. And that machine is very interesting to me because it sort of belies the truth. And the, by, by lying, the, but the, in belying the truth, you're actually indicating a level of efficiency that is actually, in some ways, very beautiful. As you see the back end of these shops, every gas meter is a restaurant you know, or a store. And yet you see beneath all that sort of exterior, the, the machinations of growth and success and community, because you figure all that, all that stuff's healthy. But behind it is you see the simulated divided light windows, and you see the, the metal cladding and the cheap brick veneer. So you kind of wonder, where is the next step? And this is another this is a development by the Remington, um, and also in Markham, called the Remington Center, of a new, the next generation of Chinese mall. Right, and you start seeing it built adjacent to the original Pacific Malls you see there on the left. And you see over time how that kitschy, quaint, new urbanist kind of place is catching up and it's becoming much more 21st century global uh, kind of Asian um, inspired um, in the 21st century way um, mercantile center. So we come to issues of zoning, land use, and formal activities, you know, with all the stuff that, the, that we, we kind of live and breathe and debate about indefinitely. But the point is, is that when you see your 80-year-old your grandmother um, waiting on the bus shelter when it's 35 degrees out in the summer after she comes out from prayer, you kind of look at this landscape and think, well, maybe there's something better that we can do, you know. Maybe we can plan a little bit more carefully to kind of leverage the, the energy that you find within this community. Similarly, in other areas of the city, um, this is a, um, there's a lot of um, Caribbean uh, population that lives in, in this area around Jane and Finch and African Canadian. But this photograph, there are 65 people in this picture, right? You go down to a street corner here in downtown Montreal, you take a photo and you come back, and I'd be interested to see how many fo pick people you find in that photograph. But when you're dealing with that kind of space between across from one side of the intersection to the other, it's not going to be a good outcome. That's why you might have issues of gang violence, of youth, uh, problems with youth, other issues, social issues. Um, it's really hard for any single mother to get around in this world, period, never mind at Jane and Finch. And so when you look around in the area and, it, and you see this kind of activity happening, you wonder where are the grocery stores? Where, is the, where, are, the, where are the services? Where are the public amenities for, for these people that live in this, and this, the citizens that live in this community? And you wonder, well, if there's problems, sometimes um, 
It's a design problem that, and a land use problem that causes a lot of social um, bifurcation and um, alienation. It's not always economic. So here, you know, you go, there's no places for the kids to play. They're banned from the Jane and Finch Mall. They can't get a, a, a fresh piece of food. They can only go to Popeye's, which is in the distance, which basically deep fries everything, including my laptop probably, um, when they, for food. And so if you wonder why there are issues, therein lies the problem. And, but in some aspects, you go into the malls, if you're not banned from the mall itself, you will find aspect, things of community information, a place, for the, a place called The Spot, which kids come and can display their photos on Facebook or talk about everything from hip hop, yoga, to teenage pregnancy, AIDS, and other things. To, um, and, and that starts to create their cracks in there and think, in the system that think maybe there's hope and there's, there's a lot of um, uh, potential to bring in new public amenities into these kinds of places. So this is inside the spot. It's very simple. But the messages are clear, sports, music, you know, computers, you know, education, implicit and all that. And, and we hope that you can kind of take that a step further. The undesigned landscapes, we mentioned this before, and you kind of think, well, uh, there are a lot of areas in Toronto where people, this is in the summertime, and maybe um, you and I may not want to take that opportunity to have a picnic out on this kind of a lawn in this sort of urban condition, but a lot of people do out of necessity, out of convenience, out of just the fact that it's a chance to get a place to get together with your neighbor. And you kind of think, well, these um, residential towers that we've designed over the past 50 years were designed for maybe a social behavior um, that existed 50 years ago. Um, but the way our demographics are changing, the way we socialize, the way we interact have changed since these towers were initially designed. And it's a challenge for all of us to come up with new ways of thinking. So similarly, you have um, old strip malls that are not accessible or that easily, uh, you know, it's called the walk-in family clinic, but, you know, if it's January, this ain't such a great walk-in family clinic if you're coming off the, the public tr bus with baby in tow. And um, a lot of these areas I mentioned because they're, they're um, these, this is serving uh, maybe lower income families, but in, in middle class families, we have similar problems as well. This is along Young Street in a, uh, a lot of Persian, Farsi uh, speaking um, um, uh, people that live in this area. And you look at, for each one of these signs, it's social capital. Each one of these signs is an organizational unit. It's a business, it's a network. And from when you're driving by in your salt-stained car splashing this young family walking on the sidewalk, it's a blur. But for other people that will have to use these facilities or go to these shopping malls, it's a lifeline or it's, it's a sense of community. And again, it's issues we need to look at in our city. Um, show this example because of a strip mall, typical strip malls, and we understand what all this means and we understand the ground floor and above floor. But what we're starting to see is that there's shortages of this kind of space in the city. So much, that's why we had that Mughal-inspired shopping mall, and that's why we start seeing um, businesses spilling out into t typically residential side streets, starting to operate more, more um, emphatically, or in areas um, being more um, open more year-round when it was typically a, a warehouse, or more, 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 more times during the day. Um, new forms of strip malls that we start seeing, um, it's kind of imp importing a... Um, a use of materiality or an expression that may not be, um, that might be more common in some parts of the world and not in Canadian context, but it's indicative of a new phase of strip mall that's a little higher on the, on the economic order. So it spans across all income and demographics. And you can go to the Home Depot or you can go to the Chinese Canadian version of Home Depot. Sometimes you, um, developers learn bad tricks from bad people, not that the Home De Depot is, um, so evil, but it's not exactly the best um, role model for urban design um, going. And so you start seeing as developments becoming, um, going up on the, on the social, um, you know, attracting a different clientele, um, unfortunately they're not always um, designed in the way that's, that's either sustainable or progressive or inviting. Um, show this kind of slide because it's interesting on, 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 uh, the, on the concept of of strip malls as you start seeing the issues of informal activities, things happening out on the street, 
you know, shishas, um, food, markets, um, store, streets being closed off, uh, even over for a uh, course of a weekend, as this case indicates the taste of the Lawrence in Scarborough. And you're seeing the whole families and everybody coming out. And um, as for a street fair, it's amazing because you start to see, um, I mean, this kid's a little bit clueless, so maybe we'll go next, but you start seeing the aspects of different types of foods and different types of, of shop, shopping that's being um, sent out, out on the street market that's a little bit more dynamic than maybe we're used to seeing. And it starts to beg the question, what else can we do to further the aspects of, of um, this kind of the richness that you see in this informal range of activity? And you see, you know, again, Taysha Lawrence, a woman in a savar kameez, uh, watching her kid on a, on a merry-go-round. And it's, it's the, what's beautiful about it is that it's rich and sophisticated without necessarily being highbrow or without being self-conscious. That, that this, this, and this are global city. And it doesn't have to be um, labeled so emphatically as such. So these are examples, this is an example of how we take um, these strip malls or these arterials, slow them down, um, add in aspects of informal activities, merchant um, of commerce, um, things that happen along, um, how do we get more varied landscape, even if it's a vacant lot, even if it's the end of a parking lot on a strip mall, how do we turn parking lots into, we saw a few minutes ago a uh, woman buying, you know, shisha, pipes and donairs on, on the, at the edge of a parking lot. How do we formalize that and turn it into something uh, much more rich, something that is, um, even if it's temporary, the infrastructure's in place to, en to enliven a suburban context to allow a multiplicity of, of um, ethnicities and cultural groups to, to develop. Um, this project, which is having trouble getting into the ground because it had some financial things with the, the crash, the economic crash of the last year or so, was Canada's first Tamil mall. And yes, it's located between somewhere and nowhere. It's in Scarborough. But you know, there's, the, there's the, the site next to the old home outfitters and down by, I don't know, Boston Pizza or something. And you look at the architectural renderings, and it's not, gr it's not it's going to set the world on fire. This is not a beautiful architecture. It's an embarrassment to be here in the CCA. We all know this. Fine. Right, but we start to look, step back, and go. Well, what is this mall actually doing? Right. So the building on the right-hand side with the little little uh, skylight, or the big skylight, is actually uh, a Tamil theater, a Tamil playhouse, uh, ESL school, uh, travel agents, uh, some restaurants, daycare, and then of course you know wrap around with all kinds of you know we can kind of imagine what this would be because we see it everywhere. But what was interesting to me is that in their drawings, they had a little squ odd-shaped square in the middle of the parking lot. And I was asking, what's this all about? And they go, well, it's a place for weddings. And you go, I don't know about you, but I don't think that going to a wedding in the middle of a parking lot on a strip mall is really my idea of fun on a Saturday night. But, you know, in the Tamil community, you have uh, you've the strip mall and, and kind of their way of mutating the the sort of dysfunctionality of some of our Canadian suburban landscape, how you actually can turn a strip mall parking lot into a festive place. You block off no cars, put up some tents, you know, envision having a wedding, and maybe you might just want to go. Maybe it might really be something delightful. Maybe it might be something as rich as this kind of uh, environment, right, where people are hanging out on a Saturday night and having a good time. So there are hope, there are again cracks in this, in, in the facade of our dysfunctional relationship as designers um, that we have with the, with our, with the suburbs to think about how we can really make a place much richer.